We have been dealing with, uh, or started a new series last week on the book of Proverbs. As I mentioned to you, I've never preached on this book as a whole book before. As we make our way through the book of Proverbs, a book of practical wisdom, looking for God and trying to find God in this book, and how does he speak to us in a very practical way? Last week, our scripture was Proverbs 1 verse 7, and it said something about the fear of the Lord is the beginning or the foundation of wisdom. As we read a little further now and we get to chapter 2, we find out that there's this emphasis on doing what is right and just and fair. These men, it said, turned from the right way. They took pleasure in doing wrong, verse 14, verse 15. Their ways are wrong or devious. So when we think of right and wrong and do what is right, what are we thinking of? How do you deal with what is right and tempted to do what is wrong, especially when no one is looking? Let's read a few scriptures. Let's read a few scriptures. Proverbs chapter 10 and there verse 2. Proverbs chapter 10 and there verse 2b has one little statement. Proverbs 10 verse 2b says, Right living can save your life. Right living can save your life. Not wrong living, right living can save your life. How does that happen? Proverbs 14 verse 2. Just flip over the pages to chapter 14 and there verse 2. Those who follow the right path fear the Lord. Those who take the wrong path despise Him. So there's a right path and there's a wrong path. And then uh, have a look at the next chapter. Chapter 15, and there verse 23b. Proverbs 15, verse 23b. It is wonderful to say the right thing at the right time. How many of you have blabbered it out and then said, Oof, Oh, I shouldn't have said that. To say the right thing, but also at the right time. Football coach Lou Holtz says, I follow three rules. I do the right thing, number one. Number two, do the best you can. And number three, always show people that you care. That's a football coach, but I kind of think those are three neat rules. If I could always go through life, go through my day and say, number one, Jerry, do the right thing, do the best you can, and show that you care. Hmm. So when we think of right, the time is always right to do what is right. Sometimes wise words are those that are simple and stand to reason. The time is always right to do what is right. It is worth doing, it is, if it's worth doing, it is worth doing right. Something my dad always said to me. Of course, Les Schwab Tires has been doing that since 1952. Uh, if you do it right, you will succeed. Uh, or is it true that good boys always end last? No, not necessarily. I know we live in a wicked world, but if you do things right, okay, let's move on. Always do what is right, said Mark Twain. It will gratify half of mankind and astound the other. And then the challenge, do what is right, even if you're flying solo. Because usually what is the, what is the temptation? Oh, everyone does it. Well, Mom, Dad, I'm moving in with my girlfriend. Well, I wouldn't like you to do that. Well, everyone does it. Right? 
Everyone does it. So everyone does it, makes it right. And so we live in a confusion sometimes, and society confuses our minds with what is right. Are you and I called and willing to move and to walk upstream against the societal stream? <clears throat> Brendan Manning said, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, then walk out the door and deny Him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. <laughs> Play on words. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. I practice and I preach. And if I don't practice what I preach, then I become unbelievable. So what does the Bible say are the benefits of doing right? Let's have a quick look at what the Bible says. And I found at least nine things that indicate to me what happens when you do right. Now, I know psychologists say that if you do right, you know, you have a better heartbeat, you feel better, your health is better, you live longer. Uh, there are lots of things. You don't walk around with a guilty weight bearing you down. But what does the Bible say? Some of the benefits that the Bible mentions. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 18 says, Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight, so all will go well with you. Then you will enter and occupy the good land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors. So, Israel, do what is right and good. In the Lord's sight. In the Lord's sight? Does the Lord see us everywhere we go? Does the Lord see you when you're alone in your room? Quietly in town, in your office? Psalm 106 verse 3. There is a joy, there is joy for those who deal justly with others. And always do what is right. You don't have to go to a psychologist to discover that, right? Right? I can be happy and joyful because I know I'm doing right. There's a sense of confidence that God gives when you know you're not burdened down by guilt. Proverbs 21 and there verse 3, the Lord is more pleased when we do what is right and just. So God is more pleased. He smiles upon us. Ecclesiastes 8, 5 and 6 says, 5b, those who are wise will find a time and a way to do what is right. I will find a time and a way to do what is right. For there's a time and a way for everything, even when a person is in trouble. I know of some of you that have been in trouble. I have been in trouble. And sometimes I'm tempted to do the wrong thing when I'm in trouble because God will understand. Can you imagine joining in the experience of our good friend uh, who was out there in Indonesia during World War II, doctor, and uh, while you were out there, you were in trouble. You were put in a, in a camp. It was wartime. The Japanese put all of you in there. And you were from Dutch origin, so that means you had to be in, in a war camp too. But you were just a teenager. Could the temptation be to do wrong? In trouble? Maybe so. I can't imagine, but I'm sure I would be tempted to do all kinds of uh, bad things or wrong things. But you know what? If I do what is right, even the enemy will say, wow, and have respect for me because I do what is right. What does the next one over there say? Uh, number four, Psalm 25. And there, verse 8, A. The Lord is good and does what is right. So God does what is right. Isaiah 26, 7. For those who are righteous, the way is not steep and rough. You are a God who does what is right. And smooth out, you smooth out the path be ahead of them. So God does what is right. So he gives us an example, a model of what it means to do what is right. Number five, John 3, 21, all 
who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. Isn't that a normal, natural thing? If I've done something bad in the dark, I don't want to go to the light because I'm afraid my sins will be exposed. Is that maybe a reason why some people don't come to church? I don't know. I'm just asking questions. If I have been living an evil life or I have been a double life, I'm afraid if I come to church, I come to the light and maybe I will be exposed. And so I'd rather stay away maybe. So all of you here are doing the right thing. <laughs> Thank you, Martha. <laughs> I hope so too. The Holy Spirit hopes so too. <laughs> Number uh, six. 1 John 2, 29, since we know that Christ is righteous, we also know that all who do what is right are God's children. How do you know you're a child of God? Well, you're doing what is right. That's the badge you wear. That's what people can see when they look at you. You're doing what is right. 1 John 3, 7, dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. Now, don't get all, tied, uh, you know, all tied up here with uh, uh, righteousness by faith and, and, and Romans. This is Proverbs. Proverbs is talking about basic, practical stuff, right? And he's simply saying, yeah, if you do what is right, you are righteous because you are doing what is right. And if you're wrong, bad, you're evil. It's simply saying it's that and nothing more. Number seven, do what is right. Genesis 4, 7. You will be accepted if you do what is right. You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. Sin is always there seeking to be in charge, to be the controller and tell you what to do. If you give in. If you give in. Number eight. Judges 21, 25, in those days Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. What kind of right was this? This was a very subjective right. You know what this verse tells me? About the modern, or I should say postmodern, generation of today. The secular generation of today live by this rule. There is no objective truth or right. It's what you perceive. It's right for you. If it's right for you, it's right. So you can't judge your neighbor. You can't judge anyone. We all live in love and peace. It's all right. Everything is fine. Everything is dandy. That's the atmosphere in which the secular society of today in which you and I live uh, move. And this is the way they think. Everything is right in your own eyes. Number nine. Psalm 84, verse 11. For the Lord God is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. Now, don't go into some bargaining match with God because He knows better, right? Daddy always knows better. Don't go into some bargaining match and say, Lord, well, here you say that if I do right, you will give me good things. And if I don't get good things come my way, then I say, Lord, why did you do that? And then I fight with God. Right? But what is the good thing? That's the point. Who says something is good? If what is good for me means a big slab of chocolate, God may be looking at me and saying, that's the last thing. That's not good for you. So what I think is good and what God thinks is good is two different things. Remember, God always answers prayer. He gives you what you ask for, or He gives you something better. And He knows what is better. I don't, because my, my view is limited. So there you have nine things, benefits of doing right in Scripture. The truth 
is that what a, your life becomes is a direct result of all the stressed out, painful, short-term decisions that you make each and every day. Each decision contributes to the results that you will realize one day you are creating your future. So you make a decision today. There's a challenge before you. Now, am I going to fill in my tax form like this or like this? This I should actually throw out. Bev often does this. She, she and I work together on that. And she says, this receipt, this doesn't count. This shouldn't be in here. You can't ask a tax break on this uh, for this receipt. And I look at it and I say, well, I don't know. I just throw things in there. And then we sort it out when tax season comes. I guess not. Throw it out. She helps me to keep my conscience straight. I think if I filled it out of my own, I'd put all those things in there. You know what? Who is it that helps us to do what is right? Who is our conscience? The Holy Spirit works in our conscience. Because there in John 16, 8, it says, When He comes, He will convict the world of sin, doing wrong, and righteousness, doing right, what is right, and that there's a judgment coming. So watch out, Jerry. Fill in your tax reform correctly. Do the right thing. How much did you charge? I just had, Bev and I had our house painted. And so we got this charge uh, and, uh, because we had some extras done, you know. And so we asked the painter, so can you break down this charge? Why is this for this and this and this and this and this? It sounds like it's a little, little much. You've had arrangements like that, haven't you? And then he, this, this, this. And, so, and I say, so what about this, 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 and this? this? Oh, okay. Well, then I guess we, we can take a hundred bucks off that. I said, well, thank you very much, because I'm not going to pay that anyway. That's not, not fair. That's not right. You were charging me for something that was just not right. And he understood it. He was a nice man, and he said, yeah, that's not right. I'll charge you a fair charge. And I said, I'm happy with that. Are you happy? He said, yes, he's happy. We're both happy. And that was a good deal. Hmm. Except Bev doesn't like the color. All right. Uh, <laughs> How do we make decisions in life? Decisions are tough things. Do you realize that all of you are thinking, feeling beings as you sit right there at this moment? How do you decide what is right? Do you decide with your mind or do you decide with your heart? Do you decide with your thinking or with your feeling? There's a little... Uh, little uh, inventory that you can fill in and find out about your uh, personality types and so forth. It's called the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator. And the MBTI tells you whether you make decisions with your thinking or with your feeling. And there's nothing wrong either way. Some of us are just more feeling-inspired when we make decisions, and others are more very rational, thinking-inspired when we make decisions. But when it comes to what God wants us to do, which one do you trust? Do you trust your mind more than you trust your heart more? Do you trust your feeling more than you trust your thinking more? The answer is both need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit, right? Both need to be baptized. You can make bad decisions with your thinking. But you know that feeling is whimsical. And my feelings change now and they're different tomorrow, and they're different in a, 10 minutes later, and now I feel terrible, and then I feel good. And think, uh, It's not good to base your decisions upon how you feel. You have to think carefully and allow God's Spirit to work on your mind and your thinking before you make a good decision. Now, let me tell you, ask you this question. Young people, is it good to get married just on how you feel about that guy? <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mindy is shaking her head. Thank you, Mindy. You're going to make a good decision one day. You're going to make a good decision. Yes. So that is, that is good. You have to really think and not just feel your way into a, a new relationship. And so when we do what is right, 
It's so easy to base our thinking on our feeling instead of upon the principles or values of the Word of God under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Does doing the right thing cost you anything? Did it, what did it cost Joseph? What did it cost Daniel and his three friends? Um, there's a modern story of Joseph or Daniel. Um, there's something wrong with your character if opportunity controls your loyalty. I mean, Joseph was in part of his house, right? And the opportunity was there to follow his feelings. But the Holy Spirit had baptized his mind based on the values that he had learned from his mother's knee. And he made a decision, not based on his feeling, but upon his thinking and what he trusted God to do for him. What did it cost him? Prison. Say it as it is. Thank you. Reputation. That's not a nice thing. Pastor must have done something bad. Look, they put him in jail. Trust. You lose, yeah, trust. You sometimes sacrifice trust. It's a, it's a hard thing. Here's a modern uh, Joseph or Daniel story. In early 2014, that's only about three years ago, four, four years ago, right? 2000, early 2014, an employee of the multi-billion dollar medical company Theranos, 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 however you pronounce that, began to worry what the company may be engaging in fraudulent activities. Despite being a relatively low-level employee in his early 20s, he decided to do something about it, so he wrote a letter to the company's CEO outlining the problems as he saw them. The response, a nasty, dismissive note from the company president. How dare you, you nincom. Shut up. And he just slammed, slammed him shut, shut. Undeterred and convinced the public had a right to know about these problems, the employee then contacted, guess who? the authorities of the city of New York and a reporter from the Wall Street Journal. Ouch. In time, almost all the employees' concerns would be validated in the media and in subsequent investigations. High-flying Theranos would see its business crumble, its billionaire founder's wealth would evaporate, and the company would be banned from its core business activity for two years by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. One little junior employee did what was right. And a billion dollar company goes, he did the right thing, right? And he got greatly exonerated, right? Huh. This world is not fair, is it? In 2018, it was charged by the SEC for years-long fraud of deceiving investors and lying to the public. Obviously, things worked out well for the whistleblower, right? Wrong. Not only was this young man replete, repeatedly threatened, bullied, and attacked by Theranos, but his family had to, uh, to consider selling their house to pay for the legal bills. His relationship with his grandfather, who sat on the Theranos board, uh-oh, is strained and perhaps irreparable. The Wall Street Journal reported that his parents had spent more than $400,000 defending their son in this matter. Hmm. Kind of. Gets our ire up there, a little indignation, you know? This is not right. It's an important reminder doing the right thing isn't free. 
Doing the right thing might even cost you everything. And yet the Stoics would remind us that this should have absolutely no bearing on whether we should do it or not. As Marcus Aurelius reminded himself and us, just that you do the right thing. The rest doesn't matter. Cold or warm, tired or well-rested, despised or honored. That was Marcus Aurelius. This young man did the right thing as he saw it. It cost him and his family an incredible amount. It cost people that he loved and respected even though they were doing the wrong thing an incredible amount. <laughs> but it was the right thing. He refused to be silenced. He would not countenance to bullying. The modern Stoic writer Nassim Taleb has a famous epigram. He says, if you see fraud and do not say fraud, then you're a fraud. Tyler, the young man in question, believed he was faced with this choice, despised and honored for it. He did what he believed he had to do. His parents summed it up well in a statement. They said, Tyler has acted exactly like the man we raised him to be. And we are ex extraordinarily proud of him. I like those parents, don't you? Now the question remains, what will you do? Will you do the right thing when it counts? When it could cost you everything? How does it feel, I mean, to do the wrong thing? How does it feel when you do the right thing? I try to imagine what abusive leaders who are still in power must be feeling as the Me Too exposure rages on. Their lives must be incredibly stressful. Can you imagine? There's a skeleton in my cupboard, or in your cupboard, 20 or 30 years ago. To see their contemporaries' actions brought out to light, crumbling lifelong reputations, and in some cases, business empires collapsing, living in fear as if they will be the next to be exposed. That must feel awful. It must be scary and so stressful. It must feel like they were standing at the edge of a cliff and everything they had worked for could tumble down any minute. At the moment of one accusation from an assistant they abused 20 years ago. Compare that feelings to leaders who have done and, and continue to do what is right. Look at the other side. They don't have that nagging fear of exposure. They are free. They know the people that work for them only have kind things to say about them when they leave the room. What do people say about you when you leave the room, when I leave the room? Leaders who act with integrity experience the freedom of being a good person with a well-built reputation, not a reputation of intimidation or fear. And that is so, so, so important. The way we treat each other says more about you than it does say about those that you mistreat. Do the right thing in business and life. If you don't, your victims will eventually heal. And in the end, the only person who will be left hurting is you. Right? If I do wrong to somebody else, that person may heal, but I'm left hurting. One of the most powerful things you can do for yourself and your world is doing what you feel deep down is the right thing to do. One of the most powerful things. How do I know what the right thing is? What is the right thing? I'm sometimes betwixt and between. What do we have? We have the Word of God. We have the principles, eternal values of the Word of God. they right there. What is right is based on the word, but sometimes it's just simple. Don't make it complicated. It's as simple as being kind instead of being judgmental. 
not trying to put someone down to feel better about yourself. Sometimes it's as simple as eating a healthy meal and then going to the gym instead of lying on the couch watching TV with chips and soda. It's the right thing to do. Doing dishes or other chores instead of slacking off. It's simple. It's the right thing to do. Putting a stop to feeling like a victim with everything against you and instead looking at the opportunities and taking action. It's that simple. Do the right thing. Conformity, however, is always there to challenge us. Conformity is doing what everybody else is doing, regardless of what is right. Right? That's conformity. Morality is doing what is right, regardless of what everyone else is doing. See the opposite? Morality is doing what is right, regardless of what everyone else is doing. J.C. Watts said, character is doing the right thing when nobody's looking. There are too many people who think that the only thing that's right is to get by. Have you seen that? And the only thing that's wrong is to get caught. That's the philosophy of our society, our secular society, our materialistic society. So, what is right is if you can get by, if it can f enhance or improve you, if it's, it's selfishly self-centered on me. The only thing that's wrong is if I get caught. And if I get caught, it's your fault. It's not acknowledging that I did wrong. It's your fault for getting me caught. For blabbing it out. We live in a very sick, strange society, don't we? Micah 6 verse 8, The Lord has told you what is good, and this is what He requires of you. Do what is right. Do righteousness. Do what is right. Love mercy and walk humbly with your God. God is simply saying to each one of us, Go out and be a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, and do what is right. Martin Luther King, never, never be afraid to do what's right, especially if the well-being of a person or animal is at stake. Society's punishments are small compared to the wounds we inflict on our own soul when we look the other way. If I don't do what is right, I hurt myself more than the other person. And lastly, another important writer who said, The greatest want of the world, can you read this with me? The greatest want of the world is the want of men, and that includes women too. Men who will not be bought or sold, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole, men who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. Helen White, the lady there, wrote that. And she wrote it in the book that she wrote, Education, page 57. The greatest want of the world is the want of men. And she wrote this already a century ago, more. Is that true? Is that what we need? Is that something that in your... Today, as we looked at Proverbs and said, Solomon, teach us, as he maybe pricked my conscience, your conscience, just a little bit, just a teeny bit, and where I may just be, have become so relaxed in my conformity and slowly allowed the world to squeeze me into its mold, as Romans 12, 2 says, and I just allowed that to happen, that maybe today... Solomon in Proverbs through the Holy Spirit is telling us, telling me, Jerry, just wake up. You need just a course correction. You go in the right way, but you know there are little foxes, there are little things. 
that have been a problem to you. And if you continue that way, remember, if you started in Los Angeles and you flew and your destiny was New York City and you as a pilot just set that guy just, it doesn't even have to be one degree, just half a degree wrong. Would you land up in New York City? Because the further you go, the further off track you get. And that seems to be the way the Christian walk is. There's those little things. Satan is not worried about getting Terry on an orphan, a big sin, you know, committing a big sin. Or Chuck, you know, that big sin. Or he's not worried about that. He's worried about just that teeny weeny, just little, little bit. Just that teeny weeny, just a little, little compromise to the one side. And it slowly he knows, if Jerry continues walking on that road, it'll get wider and wider and wider. And I'll move further away from my friend Jesus Christ. And when he comes, he will say, I never knew you. And I'll say, why not, Lord? I'll be amazed and surprised. Say, you weren't with me. You didn't stay with me. I say, wow, wow. It's time to make a new decision. We're in a new series. It's time to stand and say, I want to stand. If you want to respond to this and say, yes, I want to stand for what is right. Uh, I want to follow God. I want to follow the Word of God. I want to do what is right, even when I'm alone. Lord, help me. Reaffirm that decision. Remember, this is not a promise. It's a choice. It's a choice. I want to stand. Would you stand with me? And by standing, say, you're saying symbolically just, Lord, I want to stand for what is right. I want to do what is right. And if I do what is wrong, please convict me. May your Holy Spirit touch my heart. And this is not a case of fighting about, oh, is sleeping on Sabbath right or wrong, you know? I'm going to work in my garden this afternoon. I've got to work in my shop. I've got to fix my car. Is that right or wrong to do that on the Sabbath? That's not the question. The question is, do I love Jesus and on his day, do I walk with him in a way that honors him and that I can feel close to him and draw him in and, and, and be with him through every activity of this day? Or am I making this just another common day to catch up on all the hard stuff I do in the other six days? Do you hear what I'm saying? It's a matter of relationship. It's a matter of principle. It's a matter of the Lord. I don't want to quibble about these little things, but I want to do what is right in your eyes. And forgive me when I've done wrong. Lord, thank you that you have seen and heard our decisions today. As we stand, we stand before you and we say, Lord, thank you for loving us and guiding us and bringing us to the truth of your word. Keep us in the word. Keep us reading. Keep us listening to your word. And keep our feet moving in the right direction. And keep our focus single on the cross of Jesus Christ. And we know if that's our guide, we will reach the gates of the new Jerusalem. We long for that day. Hasten it, we pray in Jesus' name.